Welcome back on behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts and JLF Toronto. Welcome to this session of JLF Toronto's Virtual Festival 2020. The session today is The Uninhabitable Earth, David Wallace-Wells and James Raffin in conversation with Marcus Mensch. Climate change is no longer impending. We're currently in the throes of grave environmental an existential crisis and frighteningly aware of it. David Wallace Wells' latest book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, expanded from his viral article in New York Magazine, alerts us in unsparing detail to the extent of damage and despair awaiting us and presses us to imagine more effective ways to negotiate the future. Explorer and author James Raffin has worked extensively on culture and climate change. His latest book, Ice Walker, follows a polar bear's precarious existence in the changing Arctic. With global temperatures rising and ice caps melting, the book sharply spotlights the chilling reality of climate change and the fragile balance between mankind and nature. In conversation with Marcus Mench, they analyze measures to mitigate the greatest challenge humanity faces today. David Wallace Wells is a deputy editor at New York Magazine and the author of the international bestseller, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, published in 2019, which explores both the terrifying speed and scope of climate change and its likely transformation of politics and culture, economics and technology. He writes regularly for the magazine about science and the near future including his 2017 cover story on worst case scenarios for climate change and his regular column on global warming and its humanitarian impact. James Ruffin is a geographer, speaker and best-selling author. He writes for high profile international media, has produced documentaries for CBC and the Discovery Channel and is a fellow of the Explorers Club, Royal Canadian Geographical Society. He was the past governor and former chair of the Arctic Institute of North America. He has traveled through the Arctic Circle, researching and writing on culture and climate change. Marcus Mensch works on water, climate, and so in South Asia, the United States, and globally, combining narratives of transformation and resilience in complex social ecolo ecological systems. His work spans culture, art, and science in pursuit of change. He founded the Institute for Social and Environmental Transition in 1997. This conversation will be followed by Q&A, so please do feel free to send in your questions and Marcus will pose these of our speakers this evening. Do remember all our previous sessions are available to view on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, so do go and check it out and stay tuned to jlflitfest.org backslash Toronto for the full schedule and information about our speakers, both yesterday, today, and of course, tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, the uninhabitable earth, Davis Wallace Wells and James Raffin in conversation with Marcus Mench. Marcus, over to you. Well, many thanks for the introduction, Sanjoy, and it's a real honor to have two di such distinguished people to talk with today. I know for myself personally, 
the engagement with climate change started when I was young with travels and walks through the, the American Southwest and the engagement with water there and seeing the role water played and seeing the way previous civilizations had come and gone and then was expanded when I went to grad school looking at uh, climate per se at the, the early stages of modeling and realizing just how deep this, this could be, the implications. But that was in the early 80s and I, after that I went to India and, and again the water issues and the tangible meaning of that for so many local people gave me a very deep um, sense of cultural impacts and sense of the people who were going to be affected. And those are things that drive me personally. So to kick this off, I think I would, you know, maybe starting with James and then with David. Um, James's work in, in Canada is, is amazing work. But what personally started your interest in climate as you think of your period in, in Canada? And then I'd go on and ask a similar question to David. James, it's... it's Hi, Marcus and, uh, and David and uh, Sanjo and everybody. It's very nice to be here. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a first generation Canadian. I'm the, the son of a Scottish midwife and a British Navy uh, surgeon lieutenant who flipped a coin after World War II and uh, whether they would go south to South Africa and use a friend of my dad's, a Navy friend of my dad's as a beachhead or north to Canada. And so it was what it was and, and we became Canadian. And I, I sort of, with their encouragement, have been exploring this nation of which I'm an accidental citizen and it has changed. I, you know, I, 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 I went north powered by Jules Verne's stories of Englishmen at the North Pole and stories of exploration and that sort of thing. And that's what took me north in the first instance. But uh, in the 40, well, this is the first year, this crazy pandemic year, the first year in 43 that I actually have not been above the Arctic Circle. And it it's a bit weird, but places where uh, I have walked in the 70s on sea ice in July, I have swum there in latterly. And places that inspired uh, me with their grandeur, let's say in uh, Akshuk Pass on Baffin Island with these hanging glaciers, they're now like like open wounds. There's no ice there anymore. And uh, that has provided a serious compulsion. But that's also tied to, um, you know, the first instance going north thinking I was in an unpeopled wilderness, realizing when I got there that it wasn't, and realizing that the people who live at the ends of the earth. And Marcus, you've been in India and David, you, you've done your travels as well. Uh, I realize that that they are changing and being changed by circumstance as well. And, and uh, we're, climate uh, is affecting uh, more than just, just the natural world, it's affecting the cultural world. And that's one of the reasons why I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. Yeah, well, that's that's you know that really gives a sense of the that trajectory of the you know exploring as an accidental citizen as a, you know an area, but then being touched by the changes that you see in the people. Absolutely. And I think that that you know uh, it goes. I think of my own daughter who's been working in Glacier Bay for many seasons now, and <laughs> over just three three seasons, seeing changes. Uh, in the glaciers, but also in the fish and in, in what's going on. So watching that passion grow from a similar thing with her. And David, you know, what brought, what brought you into this? And, and uh, where, when you look at the writing on uninhabitable earth, um, was that something that you started with a sense of the challenge of climate and the magnitude of it? Or is it something that, that pulled you in personally through some event or other thing that 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 uh, caused you to really want to write on this? First, I want to just say um, thank you to both of you. It's really a great privilege to be speaking with both of you. And um, thanks to the festival, too, for setting it up. I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Um, the short answer is that I came to this subject out of fear. Um, I think that shows a bit in my writing. But um, unlike the two of you, I think, you know, I'm not, um, I don't, consider myself a naturalist or even in certain ways an environmentalist, I 
lived a life that was defined for most of it um, by my experience in New York City. I'm, you know, I'm 38 years old and aside from a few years um, in college at university, um, I've lived here my whole life. And I, I read about climate change, I knew about it as a sort of abstract challenge that we would be facing. But I also thought throughout you know, my teenage years, my early adulthood, that it was something that was happening elsewhere. And it wasn't gonna affect um, certainly people like me who lived in cities like New York City, but to some degree, even anyone who lived in the modern world. I sort of thought that it was an ecological challenge um, that humans could address and that was happening or unfolding in a distant way um, from most of uh, human experience. And James, what you said about your experience, um, noticing the ways that the way the ways that the way of life was changing in some extreme environments, um, strikes me really too. Because as I've been spending more and more time with this material over the last few years, I've just started to realize that um, not only is climate change an all-encompassing, all-touching transformation, which will, um, you know, have an effect on every aspect of the way that we live going forward but that it's not just a matter of um, ecosystems or ecologies um, or animal species. It's not just a matter of, you know, um, ice cap melt and sea level rise. It's about the way that we live on this planet because um, the entire history of human civilization has unfolded in a quite stable climate equilibrium, which we've already today left behind. And we're likely to see probably twice as much warming still before all is said and done, and maybe more than that, which means that everything we've ever taken for granted as a sort of permanent feature, um, the foundation on which we've built everything we know of as civilization is being shaken. And some of that civilization, of course, will endure and survive. And it's not like the world that we'll be living in 50 years from now will be completely transformed, unrecognizable. Um, but so much of what we have built the system on is shifting that we don't yet know exactly how we will adapt and change. And I think um, the story of the next 50 years of the next 100 years, perhaps even longer, depending on how much carbon we continue to produce, will be defined in a kind of profound way by this force, such that we won't really be able to tell any human story that unfolds in that time period without reflecting on or touching on the impact of climate. That's how profound and also um, all-encompassing it truly will be. And I still relate to that story a little bit as an outsider. I still think of myself as a sort of a, a journalistic interloper um, who doesn't even deserve to share the stage, say, with, with the two of you. Um, and yet, considering just the scale of that story and how dramatic it is, um, I think it, it, I felt personally, you know, not to get too grand about it, but personally called to action this seemed transparently to me to be the biggest story of our time. And if I wasn't paying attention to it and people like me weren't paying attention to it, um, then we weren't gonna do the things that we needed to do to you know, try to engineer at least a relatively s soft landing for ourselves as a species. Um, and so I'm, I, that's where I am today. I still feel um, the residue of my earlier life as a, um, you know, as a real urban dweller who, um, who thought of climate change as something that was happening um, far away, um, even as I even as I sort of stared in the face um, every day, and my experience staring in the, in the face every day is still the one that awoke it in me in the first place, which is to say, fear. I'm quite scared about just what will happen if we don't um, move very very quickly. Yeah, I I certainly share that that feeling. I mean, on one level, I'm you know surprised and honored to be on sharing this, this with you as well, the scope of the writing and with James. Um, and that question of an immediate tangible fear, you know, this year, the fires came within 15 minutes of our place. Um, we, you know, I was in the mountains beforehand and just the dry crackle of the hills was much more intense than I'd ever been, had. And I grew up in the hills here. So it's, you know, it's beyond my, my personal experience what was happening this year and the, the intensity of, you know, we weren't there at the moment the fires came closest, but knowing that had they jumped the slope, had they jumped the creek below us, it would have been 15 minutes before our town was gone up in Gold Hill in the hills above us. So there's a very visceral feeling, you know, of that as, as, as one who's felt, you know, a little isolated from it that it's something I study, and it's something I watch, 
but it's not something that would hit me personally directly in quite that way. So that, you know, from a more rural perspective, that's there as well. But, you know, if you think on what can be done, you know, James, as you, as you have trekked across different parts of the Arctic and talked with people, are there things that surprise you, either about the pace of change and the magnitude of the impact, or about things that people are doing or places where there's actually changes that you wouldn't have expected that are more positive? Um, is there anything in that that's, that's emerged in your, your travel? Well, Marcus, I think probably one of the big surprises, I, 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 probably back five, six years ago, um, I committed to put a human face on climate change because for many people who, you know, a lot of people are looking north um, because of climate change and the images that often come back are of polar bears in an unpeopled wilderness. So I thought, wouldn't it be, having, having lived and traveled, uh, you know, as a cultural geographer and, and, uh, and a writer, I know a lot of people, I'd met a lot of people. I, and, and the surprise, Marcus, was I went to put a human face on climate change and I traveled around the world at the Arctic Circle. I thought it would take a year, it took three, but I sat in an awful lot of people's, um, you know, food prep places and traveled. And um, so everybody said this, um, sure, we climate change is upon us, and we we deal with it. We've been dealing with change for millennia, and so people in Kalaktuk, which is above the Arctic Circle on the Coronation Gulf in northern Canada, said, uh, you know, there are places where there there isn't ice now, or there used to be. People are dying as a result of that. Uh, we go to the fish at the mouth of the Tree River, um, where we used to let our children run free because we could see them. <laughs> there are no trees. Um, the Lapland rhododendron and the, the dwarf willow and the birches are sufficiently high growing with a long, longer summer, warmer soils that the bushes are now high enough to hide the children and also hide the bears. So, so climate change is a threat. But it didn't matter whether I was in Siberia or Alaska, it didn't matter, you know, northern, northern uh, Scandinavia, without a doubt and without uh, exception. People said, yeah, we're used to dealing with change. We can deal with change. We will, we have. But the change that is really most affecting us is cultural change. Burying the last syllables of land nuanced languages that our elders are taking with them to the grave or burying the promise of the future in our young people who are taking their own lives at unprecedented rates. And what's that about? Well, you know, if you if, if you look at the northern cultures and, you know, there are four million people who live at or above the Arctic Circle in, in the world and they, they are all connected to the landscape in one way or another and the landscape is changing and what's changing with it is, is the culture of the people and for us to somehow tease out the, the natural environment as the object of our concern and affections as somehow separate or distinct from the amalgam of culture and uh, well human concerns and natural concerns i think is a fallacy and it's the people of the north who've taught me that yeah yeah i mean that that i would say resonates here as well i mean there is a tremendous natural physical change but the nature of the mountain communities in colorado and the nature of the communities that i've worked with closely in india is changing and one of the places I see this tremendous innovation emerging, you know, there is a lot of things that people are doing. Um, do they add up to the scale of climate and what's going to happen with food systems, other things that, you know, you know, David, you know, when you, when you look at it from that, that macro perspective, the overall uninhabitable earth, you know, how much do you see people, and cultures um, as both part of the the problem and the solution, and the the, the sense that that uh, that the challenge is not just climate, but is also our culture. Well, I, I, like James, I see um, our our culture changing, and I see that not just in among those people who are living closest to the to the landscape and um, closest to the natural world, but um, really all of us. I mean, when you think about the way that, you know, Sydney was so choked with wildfire smoke last year that, you know, fire alarms were going off in office buildings because they thought 
you know, only smoke from within that building could be producing, you know, only a fire within that building could be producing smoke that thick. Um, or here in, you know, New York where we, we had Hurricane Sandy um, and it felt like a, you know, a generational event, but we're told that at just two degrees of warming, which I think is almost inevitable, um, those kinds of storms which used to take place only once a century will be hitting once every year. Um, we see, you know, we're, we're seeing the climate impacts arriving quickly and we're, we're adapting. Um, we're also adapting in terms of our political culture in trying to reduce our reliance on um, fossil fuels to limit the amount of future warming. But I think we're doing that far too slowly. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, if you want to preserve the world that you see outside your window today, uh, there's really nothing that's going to allow that to happen. And there's certainly nothing that's going to happen that will allow the climate of our grandparents and our great grandparents and our ancestors much, much older than that. Um, though that world, that climate is simply lost. I often say it's like we've landed on a new planet and it's got a new climate. It's roughly similar to our own, but it's not the same that produced humans or human culture. And we have to figure out what of the civilization that we've smuggled with us onto this planet can survive these new conditions and what we'll have to adapt to. You know, since I wrote the book in 2018, there's been a, you know, honestly, a kind of a global political awakening. Um, the UN published this big report on the difference between 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming and two degrees Celsius of warming um, that had this sort of instigating effect um, Greta Thunberg had just started her school strikes in Sweden, but she became a, a global figure and the school strikes became a global movement. In the US, we had Sunrise Movement. In the UK, we had Extinction Rebellion. And all around the world, for the first time, really, policymakers um, began to get serious in their pledges um, to reduce their use of carbon. So we've seen, you know, the UK committing to zero carbon by 2050, banning the sale of new um, internal combustion cars by 2030, which is quite fast. Um, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, these, these countries have made even um, faster net zero pledges so fast, I'm not sure that they'll be able to honor them even if they tried. Um, we've seen Japan and South Korea recently, and most notably China, uh, make a net zero commitment over the, just um, the last couple of months. And again, you know, the, the entire history of climate action suggests that we should take all these pledges with a grain of salt because no action in the history of um, the concern for climate, no commitment has ever been honored. Um, and yet we're starting to see a focus on this issue all around the world at the highest levels of policymakers, I think in, a, in an unprecedented way. Um, that's very encouraging. And honestly, it's, it's beyond what I would have thought was possible when I first, when I finished writing my book in the fall of 2018, two years ago, which is not that long a time, a huge amount has, has changed. Um, and I think that that's exhilarating, not just um, in the sense of what has been made possible by that political awakening, but by why that, what that portends for the future, which is to say, if what seemed impossible two years ago now seems quite doable right in front of us, what does that mean about what will finally seem possible five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now? And in fact, we need that kind of acceleration going forward because even what was once unthinkable today's climate action program is still woefully inadequate if we want to um, say halt warming below what scientists have long considered a catastrophic level, which is to say two degrees. I think the project before us is both to accelerate that decarbonization and also to begin to think in a much more concerted way about how to adapt and how to live in a world that is transformed by these forces so that we're not caught flat footed by you know, um, unprecedented typhoons through uh, the Indian Ocean, say, um, or um, hurricane after hurricane. You know, we, we saw two hurricanes, category four, category five, making landfall a few weeks ago within 15 miles of each other. These are storms that used to be really, you know, you used to see them once every 30 years, 40 years, and we saw them in this case in the span of two weeks. Um, to respond resiliently to those challenges is going to take a really um, dramatic concerted effort. And we're beginning to see some cultural changes at the local level and at the political level to try to do that. But as is the case on the, on the mitigation side, on the decarbonization side, it's just moving far too slowly. Um, we need much, much more awareness, much more political pressure, and ultimately much more um, action. I always say, you know, 
this is the orienting challenge of our century. Um, and it really does need to, I think, be at the center of the way that we think about any planning we do, any policy we do, any investments we do um, going forward, if we have a hope of really um, developing, building, securing a relatively flourishing, relatively prosperous and relatively just future for ourselves, not just in the wealthy corners of the world where we can afford to build enormous defensive infrastructure, but in the parts of the world um, where that's a much bigger burden, um, including very especially India. Um, these are huge, huge challenges, um, not just you know, scientific, not just technological, not just political, um, but also in terms of um, social justice, global social justice. And we, we need, probably need to start thinking about that as part of the equation as well. Yeah, I mean, I, what strikes me here at both ends of the spectrum is this sense of culture change. And also the sense that, uh, you know, that progress has been glacial in terms of our response to climate. But on the other hand, it's precisely uh, what, you know, what James probably has been seeing, that glaciers change much more quickly than you expect at times. And so, you know, glacial, but that potential of a tipping point culturally um, you know, on both the mitigation, the, the reductions in carbon emissions, and on the cultural shifts, the behavioral shifts that will allow adaptation effectively. I mean, when you listen to that global perspective, uh, you know, James, how does that, are there places that really, really resonate with what you were seeing, you know, locally with the local communities in the Arctic? Well, absolutely. Um, but the, the notion of agency and, and what role an individual has to play uh, is, is something that is created by your socioeconomic circumstances. And I mean, one of the things that, well, a couple of things that I've started doing, Marcus, is, is uh, I just spent 30 days in a Polynesian sailing canoe uh, as part of a team gathering data for the first comprehensive atlas of the Marshall Islands. So, you know, just north of the equator in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, because I met people from small island states uh, in the Pacific, in the Arctic, and I, I got really curious about that. And to realize, uh, for northerners to realize that, um, you know, their ice is going away. And this, I mean, I see myself as a go-between. I mean, the Northerners are saying, gee whiz, our ice is melting. And people in the Marshall Islands are saying, gee whiz, the sea is rising. And to get people together to say, hey, there might be some kind of connection. Well, it's crazy. The other thing that, that really resonates with me here is that, uh, and, and it's shaped very much what I'm doing outside my own kind of writing practice is I've stopped talking to people who look like me. And then instead taking the resources that I have, the experience that I have, the network that I have, working with young people in the North to help them get some sense of traction with the ideas that they have. And I mean, uh, Last time I worked with an organization quite a bit called Students on Ice, which is a Canadian organization that takes youth from around the circumpolar world to the ends of the earth. And um, we got kids to workshop a script for a short film uh, that became called Two Breaths. And it's it's just but it it's just a short film that that actually you know has has been at some influential conferences. Um, but it's the kids' voices, and that to me is key in finding a way forward. I mean, my worry as a writer, and this came as something of an epiphany before Ice Walker, this current book, was that, uh, you know, at 20, uh, you know, a couple of dozen books later that I've written and edited, uh, I think I've cre helped create, uh, you know, a couple of generations of really smart consumers um, who I haven't changed anybody's behavior about anything. And for the, just before Ice Walker, I, you know, I worked with a bunch of filmmakers and realized, and I don't know why this came as a shock, but filmmakers aren't aiming so much at your head as they are at your heart. And that to me, I mean, the combination of idea, um, music, uh, image, uh, packaged together that is about story and narrative as well as about message is very different than 
Yeah, you know, I mean, David, you're in a category of uh, a very small category and you writing about the circumstances of climate change and telling us about, you know, the worst case scenarios, but you do that in such an engaging way. But by and large, that kind of information just washes over people. My problem was how do you change, how do you hope to change or even have a ghost of a chance of changing somebody's behavior? And that's where my book Ice Walker came one, which was essentially a space it's 30 months, it's it's a portrait of humanity in 30 months in the life of a female polar bear in southwestern Hudson Bay who encounters all these things that we're doing to the earth. And all the book is, it's a little wee short book, but it's a space for people to think about what they're doing to the earth in the hope that there might be some uh, thread, some uh, uh, kindling of a, of a spark or a fire for them to actually think about changing behavior. Because I think... Yes, the policy changes higher up are happening probably a little bit more quickly than than they might have and they have over over the years, but we still need to change the individuals and the small communities. And to do that, I think we need to find a way for the people in those communities to have some sense of agency in the future, rather than just kind of tune out and say, you know, climate change is happening, A, or it's not going to happen to me, or B, it's happening to me and I can't do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that sense of agency and that sense of how do you connect emotively with a sense of agency that that it's 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 not just telling you what's happening or telling you what should happen, but that there's a place emotively that you have a vision of the future. That's where some of our work we we did a whole set of things on resilience narratives that involved. Uh, shadow puppets. Um, it was very heavily based in science, but it was also very heavily drawing out of local traditions of communication and local people actually framing a lot of what was being shown and, and done. Um, oh, Marcus, that, those, uh, those uh, pottery pieces you did with your brother, I, I think, are just absolutely beguiling. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a stroke of genius to think, think that you could tell part of your story collaboratively, which is cool, but also in an object that just spins around. <laughs> right, that is, that is there and tangible. And kids go and spin it and yeah. then and can see stuff. But I mean, David, when you, when you think of that question of, giving people agency you know you look at the scale you look at what's happening you know and i completely agree that there are big structural changes that that need to take place um and i keep on thinking you know a good friend of mine who was the nepal water minister for a brief time used to say politicians don't move where they see the light they move where they feel the heat and it's that that sense of that upwelling of of people pushing for those policy changes, where do you see you know that that um, emotive connection coming into into what you write about and your analysis? Well, on the question of agency, you know, I I always try to say um, when we're thinking about worst case scenarios or even quite bleak sort of median scenarios, um, when we're thinking about you know cities in South Asia and the Middle East that could be so hot during summer that it would be hard to walk around outside on some days without risking heat stroke or death or 150 million people who might die of air pollution at just two degrees or you know the increase in warfare or the, the, the cuts to agricultural yields. When we think about these incredibly dramatic and quite scary possible outcomes, ultimately they're a sign of the power that we collectively have over the planet. You know we're not going to be warming to five degrees Celsius or even three degrees Celsius or even two degrees Celsius um, without making that happen ourselves. Um, you know, there are systems in place, um, chiefly, you know, the fossil fuel um, systems that are, are driving this, but, um, and, and it'll be hard to deconstruct them and, um, and replace them. Um, but these are human systems and they are under human control. Now that doesn't mean that they're under the control of, you know, me, Marcus, and James. Um, if uh, right. if they were, then we, we'd have a much better time. Um, All right. But you know, but and and I think that is that is the real on the question of agency. It's less about um, human power over uh, the fate of the natural world, 
climate change is demonstrating that humans have power over the fate of the natural world. Um, the problem is whether we as individuals can access um, the, the power within our own human societies to make the right choices. Um, and to me, that's why, you know, the last couple of years have been so exhilarating. Um, even as someone who is, you know, came to the subject out of fear and remains quite alarmed, I do think that we're demonstrating more and more the capacity to reorient our politics and our policy around these priorities. Now, again, I don't want to give anyone any false sense of optimism or hope. I think that there's, uh, there are a lot of really um, bleak and inevitable climate outcomes um, that are now essentially baked in. Um, but I do think that we've made the worst case scenarios considerably less likely over the last few years. And we have a chance to do much more of that. And the most inspiring part of this whole global political awakening to me is to think about um, you know, the global climate strikers who are many of them, almost all of them are underage. So they literally don't have the vote even in countries where the vote is quite open. Um, many of them come from marginalized communities. Many of them are queer. We're talking about people around the world that you could almost not imagine more disempowered people. And so if people like, you know, the three of us look at the system and find ourselves feeling a little dejected about how little we can do, I think we can really be inspired by these teenagers who were not just as disempowered as we are, but considerably more disempowered, looked at that problem and said to themselves, we don't have a seat at the table, but we're gonna make a seat at the table for ourselves through our voice and then did it and literally reoriented global climate politics in the space of a few years. Now, again, not sufficiently, you know, but so much more um, progress has been made and so much more progress has been committed to because of that movement than, um, than was the case before. And I find that incredibly inspiring. The flip side of it is that I think that we're all also getting used to a scale of natural disaster that our, uh, that our grandparents would have been horrified by. Marcus, you mentioned the fires in, in Colorado, which um, are basically in, in, in historical memory unprecedented. I think about the, the fires in California, which, you know, two years ago, we had this um, horrifying season in California, unprecedented off the charts season. And there was a kind oh, of a wow. global terror in response. People were really paying attention to the fires in California. And we're saying climate change is here, climate change is scary, let's take action. Two years later, we had another fire season and the global response, at least to my mind, was much more muted, even though the fire season was more than twice as bad as the one in 2018. And I worry about that pattern developing alongside um, our global political awakening, that we, we sort of normalize more and more suffering from climate and more and more natural disaster because we're seeing it more and more. We get really alarmed when we see something for the first time. But when we see it for the fifth or sixth or seventh time, we sort of categorize it then as normal and acceptable. And I think that that's, um, that's sort of a recipe for disaster. We need to, to the extent that we can, retain the long view, try to be as horrified by some of these disasters as our grandparents might have been. <laughs> and also keep in mind that we may not be able to see the impacts of the decarbonization that we do now for another few decades. So we still need to be, uh, but we still need to be motivated um, just as much to make that difference so that our grandchildren um, are living in a relatively more comfortable, relatively more prosperous, more flourishing, more just world. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I'm beginning to, we've got probably, uh, you know, three or four minutes before uh, questions and I'm beginning to get questions popping up. But, you know, when I think of normalization, here we are um, doing the Jaipur Literature Festival over Zoom. Um, I'm, you know, I had a, had a little bit of a scare with things and have been in quarantine for the past week. Um, and so I'm kind of now reveling in my freedom, um, having gotten, gotten negative testing. Um, there is, you know, the progress on the vaccine and that sort of thing um, for COVID is an amazing change in terms of pace and that sort of thing. And yet at the same time, we see all the mixes of behavior from the top political levels, from absolutely disastrous to really thoughtful, and at the human level, from incredibly empathetic and working with people to being, um, you know, ideologically driven. And so we get the whole sort of kind of a microcosm 
pressing in on us, you know, coming in or uh, example with the, with the pandemic of some of the things we'll have to deal with on a much longer term time scale as climate. Um, you know, maybe what I do is say really quickly uh, before I go to questions, if each of you had two or three things that you saw as really important to happen soon, um, you know, um, James, you know, that would, that would really kickstart things, what would they be? And then just keeping it just to a minute or so, so that we can then go to the uh, uh, questions, because it's 10 minutes to the end of session. I'll be very brief, Marcus. I would suggest that people read my book. It's called Ice Walker, and it has a reader's guide in the back. It's meant to be a space to think about these things. And uh, the, uh, in some ways, the COVID uh, circumstance has made us into these little microcosms where we are thinking about ways to affect our world. And I think this may be a wonderful time to do that. And uh, there are 50 other things, and you both have as many, perhaps more than I do about things that we could do immediately. But uh, I think it's a matter of bringing uh, our own consciousness uh, to a point where we might put how we behave and what we do onto the table as not given, but in a way, uh, uh, objects of our, uh, of our desire and affections and uh, that we can change if we want. Right. And, and David, you know, aside from reading your book, which I would highly suggest anybody do, you know, one or two things that I really want to get to questions. Well, I think, you know, James is absolutely right that COVID has taught us something about the nature of the world in which we live, which is that um, it's much more fragile and vulnerable, but also that the way, the way that we ourselves live is much more changeable than we might have thought. And I think we saw that, especially in the spring with the rapid, we went from not even having heard of this disease to having totally transformed the economic and personal and romantic and social lives of literally billions of people um, in the space of a few weeks. Um, that is incredibly inspiring and encouraging once unimaginable change at the scale we, we probably need to really get a handle on climate. But we now have this opportunity in front of us because Many of the nations of the world, not just in the West, but really all around the world, are engaged in an unprecedented degree of stimulus spending to um, protect and support the livelihood of their citizens. And what we really need to do in an urgent way is take that opportunity for climate progress to try to make those investments, not to subsidize the fossil fuel business or support those people who are working in adjacent industries, but to try to rebuild an, uh, a new green world for ourselves. And there have been studies showing that actually just a fraction of the stimulus spending that is being um, you know, set into motion these days, um, if made regular, uh, could alone um, produce a renewable energy revolution and decarbonize the planet in the space of a decade or two. So we don't even need to spend as lavishly as we're spending to deal with um, the coronavirus in order to bring about the world that we all would like. Unfortunately, we run the risk, if we don't deal with climate right now, of exhausting that capacity and turning the page a few years from now with governments unwilling or unable to make those kinds of investments, which means the op taking the opportunity right now is enormously important. So let me read a couple of questions here so that I, I get them out quickly. Twyla Rose asks, James, tell us a little about your experience doc documenting uh, Naruchak. Um, and Avril Alex asks, David, a massive climate clock has been installed in New York City. Does it mean we're in the end game? Then Jenna asks, for both of you, do you think the pandemic hitting this year and other rapid climate changes taking places are literally following the Malthusian theory? And if so, would it be safe to assume that this is the way the planet is resetting itself by trying to bring back the balance in the ecosystems? So that's kind of three, three of the questions, you know. <laughs> A little bit about experiences, the massive climate clock, does it mean we're in the end game? Which is kind of related to the Malthusian question. Um, you know, and, and James, was, you know, another question was, in your travels, was there an experience that stands out and continues to be lifelong memory? So it's kind of that mix of the personal and the, and the big Malthusian, are things ticking down? Where are we? Uh, uh. In terms of experience with bears, I, I began life as a marine biologist studying polar bear vision and turned away from the bedrock of science towards the landscape of 
cultural anthropology. And but I have remained true to a fascination with bears. And and I'll just simply say that that I've made it my business to know how bears live in in the wild and that sort of thing. The Malthusian observation makes me think of James Lovelock. It makes me think of. Uh, that this 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 needs a quantity of really nice Scotch whiskey and a, a fire so that we could sit down and 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 talk about what really drives uh, humanity and uh, you know uh, we are very quickly leaving the um, quantitative parameters of economics and politics and science in those kind of questions uh, if just to hand it over to hear what <laughs> David might like to say about this. Um, I want to believe that that uh, that this motivation of the planet notwithstanding, I, I really believe that this pandemic will, in the fullness of time, have a seriously positive effect on people's perceptions of humans place in the uh, in the cosmos. And that's a good starting point there for you, David. <laughs> well, on the question of endgame, you know, the clock, I believe, is counting down the amount of time we have until we exhaust the budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius. And I think practically speaking, not only are we in the end game for that, but we have no hope of avoiding 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. We're at about 1.2 yeah. degrees now. I think almost certainly we will reach two degrees as well. Um, but you know, just how bad it gets after that is entirely up to us. And that means um, there's basically no end game. And in a certain sense, this is quite scary because things could continue to get worse for a very long time. In fact, some of the changes we're putting into motion now, um, you know, especially the melting of, of the planet's ice sheets um, could take many millennia to unfold. Um, and the humans that are alive on this planet for that time, we'll be dealing with those impacts um, for not just centuries, but perhaps thousands of years. And that I think is a, a reminder of just how dramatic the changes that we're really engineering are and how long-term, even though we're changing the climate at a faster rate than it's ever been changed before in planetary history, um, we're also changing it in a way that's going to take a lot longer to unfold. Um, it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around that. Um, but to me, this is a matter, this is a, raises the question of just how humans will choose and find ways to live and live happily on a planet that is defined by natural disasters at a scale that most humans have never seen before. Um, I do think we are an adaptable species. The question is, can we adapt or in what ways will we adapt to changes that are this fast? But when I think about it at an abstract level, I think, you know, we have, we can support not just 8 billion people, but maybe 10 billion people on the planet, if we are running our human systems properly. Um, the question is, can we get to that place soon enough um, and thoroughly enough um, all around the globe so that Malthusian challenges don't become too big a problem? I think that is possible, but I think it's also an open question, um, which we're all going to be answering in the decades ahead and um, the final outcome is, you know, very much up in the air. But I certainly don't think that I, I certainly wouldn't want to write that history yet, because um, no matter how hot the planet gets, no matter how bad climate suffering gets, it will still always be the case that the generation of humans alive at that, that time will have the ability to forestall future warming, limit future suffering if they take faster action then. Um, so. In that sense, I, I, I prefer not to think of this in binary terms, you know, like climate change is here, climate change has destroyed us, or talk about an end game, or I like to think of it as um, we've already left behind the, you know, the normal um, and where we land on the spectrum of uh, tra a transformed planet is up to us today and will always up to be up to us in the future, um, should we have the courage to act um, you know, to secure that, that sort of a future for ourselves. Yeah, so we, we've got about, I, I think, a minute and a half left, uh, something like that. Um, you know, the good thing I hear from both of you is, you know, we're not just putting rubber stoppers on the deck chairs of the Titanic to avoid scratching the decks as we go down. You know, that we've, we've, we, there are things happening, there are choices we can make, and there's 
living coming forward. You know, there's a couple of questions here. You know, just one person asking the environment became better as it, during the pandemic. You know, is this something we can sustain? Is this a model? You know, the redu reductions in admissions and the sense that over the past 20 to 30 years, there's been a real growth in the climate, uh, the emissions, and that there was a socio-political change that may have happened at that point that really triggered things. Are we seeing another socio-political change here? I think that you touched on that, uh, David, but, you know, just a quick, quick last minute thoughts around those would be great. Well, I think that we wouldn't want to continue to suffer in the way that we've suffered throughout the pandemic in order to produce the emissions cuts that we have. Like the planet has been, you know, in many ways scarred by this experience. So we want to find a, a, a better path, but we actually do need to cut emissions at about that rate every year going forward um, to avoid catastrophic levels of warming. As for whether this represents a new political moment, I think we don't yet know. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are, um, we are now spending at levels that we have never spent before or all around the world. We may find ourselves in the next decade much less worried about debt and much more comfortable making those kinds of concerted um, public investments, maybe inspired by the Chinese model as much as we were inspired by, um, by the free market models of the West going forward. I don't know. Um, I think it's possible, but we have to fight to make those um, choices ourselves. They're not going to make them... They're, they're not going to be made on our behalf without pressure. Um, yeah. So we may be we may be turning a page here into a more a slightly more hopeful future, um, but it's certainly James, not. I, I want to make sure that James gets a moment just quick before we get changed over to Sanjoy. I, I would just say in closing, Marcus, that David, uh, I didn't come. I came into this conversation not absent of hope. But I am leaving with more hope, having heard you and met you in person here, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, 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 and I, I, I'm pretty sure that hope is something we choose, and you seem to be doing that in a way that uh, uh, I, I've really appreciated here and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, Marcus. Thank you. Well, and thanks to both of you, James and David. Yeah, really wonderful to be having a conversation here. And I think it, Sanjoy is showing up on the screen, so it's probably time to uh, get off our hats and, and go over to the, uh, the maestro. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you, James. Thank you, David. As you said, we have to fight to make sure that this conversation is heard. There are young people who have found that place at the table and they have made a difference. Whether that will stop climate change or global warming as we know it. Uh, I think the jury is out on that. But what we can do collectively is continue to speak about it, spread knowledge and information, and push back on the enormous amount of greed, on the amount of misinformation and hatred that we see around conversations like this. So once Amen, again, Sandroy. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, just more and more platforms. I mean, we are fighting in many ways that really last ditch effort to make a difference. And it's not that all of us are doing very well. Uh, hatred is gaining much more ground. It's more popular than anything that we all have been able to do. But these conversations that a lot of people just sort of tune off uh, when they hear it, because they don't think it's going to affect them till that fire burns its way through their home, till that person next to them or a family member actually gets infected and gets to hospital where they're not being able to uh, be helped in any way. Those are, those are the times that it comes home to them. And while it, it may be horrible to say that this is the reality, it is. But let's do our bit. Thank you to each of you for being so amazing and for the writing the work that you've done and putting so much of time and your energy into doing so. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. We're sorry we couldn't take all of the questions. Yes, these are vital issues, but we wanted to allow our speakers their time to be able to give us a sense of how they see the future of the world. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers available through bookstores 
listed on the GLF Toronto website. So please do have a look and book on that. Once again, a big shout out to all our partners for their support. Thank you all. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this conversation and will tune in to our next session, Kahani Online, The Boy and the Drum, a story dramatization with Rohini Vij. And that's at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 12 noon Pacific Time, and 1.30 a.m. IST. And now, delighted to present a reading by Francesca D'Angelo from the short series. And post that, do remember, look forward to seeing you back tomorrow. <laughs> Hello everyone. Thank you for having selected my poem for this festival. Very honored. Thank you. My name is Francesca D'Angelo. I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm enrolled in the Humber's Creative Writing Program. The title of my poem is To Gen Z. You are our only hope. Everything hinges on what you do next. Didn't mean to make you hold your breath or stand up tall. We don't need any of that. Act stealthily, in fact. Move slowly, insidiously, but quickly. Break it all down so we may try to rebuild. Leave those buyback jeans that make you feel eco-conscious or wear those buyback jeans, whatever, but just do what you gotta do. To the Gretas, stand up, lay low, move quickly, swiftly, and tear it all down. I don't care. I will be here to cheer you on because my moment passed. I helped fuck you. Helped fuck this all up. Never said anything when the 90s saw those multilateral agreements unfold. I stood aside. Never screamed loud enough. Now I want to shout. Shout at the world. But my voice in this arena fades. A mid 40 mother, step aside. Look how disinterested, how they cheat, a colleague disdains. They can't even cheat well. They set up WhatsApp groups right before my eyes, in the chat boxes of our virtual class sessions, said the professor in her blundstones. Check your goggles, we cheated them. What did we expect? Did we think the Starbucks coffee was going to come for free? But they sustainably source their beans, said the Honduran child. Smoke fills the air, the wind does not clear. Navigate through it all. Put on your rose-colored linen frames. Can you see it? Can you see the path? Tell me, tell me. What does it look like? Is it safe? Can we move through it? Hang on. Do you want me to grab you a Trenti iced latte? 12 pumps sugar-free vanilla, four pumps skinny mocha, splash of soy, coffee to the star on the siren's head, ice double blended? If so, let me grab my Victoria's Secret Amex to double up on my birthday points. <clears throat> Look, you can buy a $2.99 shirt on sale. Isn't that worth the COVID price? You are amazing because you buy secondhand, says Business Insiders. Get off the Netflix, Disney Channel Plus, Amazon Prime, Apple Plus. Move into the digital world and act.